got a question. Ask Tom on Home Show Radio. This is Home Show Radio live on Facebook and YouTube. Your questions, Tom's answers. Now here's Tom Tynan and Charlie Mosier. Hello. <laughs> See you right there. There Hello. we are. There we are. Hello. Hello. Hi. Welcome to Ask Tom Live. Where's Tom? Oh, yay. There he is. Okay. I'm Tom. And I answer home improvement questions, believe it or not. I try to make it interesting and fun. I don't do the sound effects. That's not my ball game. But that's Mr. Mosier, who's somewhere here in the studio with his triangle. And soon to have a tambourine, I've been told. But you don't have a tambourine sound. That's not a tambourine. That's one of those video things. No, that's Bozo the Clown. Okay, and welcome Bozo the Clown. No, not Charlie Mosier. But Ronald McDonald. Anyway, we're going to hear it answering your questions. I do it on the radio 35 years now. Uh, home Show Radio on Sports Radio 610 in Houston, Texas. Do it 9 to 12 on Saturday and 8 to 11 on Sunday. Uh, Central Time, and of course you can catch it anytime you want going to homeshowradio.com where we get a lot of questions also and we're going to answer some here today at our Facebook slash uh, YouTube live. And of course before me on Saturdays we have an expert who even joins us in the last weekend of every month here on this particular segment of Ask Tom Live is Danny Milliken, a genius when it comes to planting. He knows the Houston area well, the Texas area well. He's a eighth or ninth generation Texan, but he knows his plants. He's got a great extensive background and a lot of good people that help him. And I know Charlie can jump in here now and explain a little more about all those people because I'm too busy getting ready for my show with all the show prep I have oh, yeah. to do to, to worry about what Danny's doing before me. Yeah, the home show pros, the garden pro, home show garden pros. There you go, a, see? Yeah, it's a, it's a, a, a group of um, a half dozen um, locally owned um, nurseries that are, whoops, not there, that one. Um, <laughs> yes. All right. Anyway. That reminded me of something when I saw it. Go ahead. Yeah, right. <laughs> I don't want to know about it. Okay. Yeah, We're okay. not going there. I don't um, want anyway. to go back there either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, so it's a group of, of local nurseries that we've put together that help answer your questions about gardening and so on. And, and the, the, every week, every one, there's a different one on and they have a different knowledge base and they can help you, uh, do you get more from your gardening? That's what the, the garden pros are about. And of course, what we do here is answer your questions. If you want to get your questions on, go and put them in the comment section down, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, and we'll come in here now. There are people who watch this on the Garden Pros page or on um, or my own page on Facebook. If you want your questions to appear on the show, you have to go to Home Show Radio um, on Facebook or the Home Show Radio on YouTube. Either one of those, we'll get your questions here. We'll put them up, and Tom can answer them. Came to my attention last week. We weren't um, we weren't seeing some of them. So okay, that's, and also I'm going to give a quick plug to Mosier Media, which is Charlie Mosier's outfit. He's a marketing genius. He works all over the country. He kept me on the air for probably 27 out of those 35 years. There's no doubt about it with his geniusness. And if you want to get into advertising and market your company really well, Mosier Media, Houston, Texas. There, Charlie, I had to do it once in a while for you. Yes, and the need has never been greater because Sandy has <laughs> yes. finished, almost done with the uh, kitchen and bathroom. So next, you and know, God only knows what's next. And the swimming pool is coming so. up next. <laughs> yes. Actually, what's next is what's news. Okay, let's move we on. Start, we start off with uh, news around the world and up your block to help you with your home improvements. And this week, good news. You know, you wonder the Texas legislature only meets every other year. So what do they do when they come in? Well, this time they actually helped tame the HOA a little bit. Um, you may not be aware of this, but HOAs in Texas have enormous power. Um, they are, uh, for one thing, they are they have the ability to foreclose on properties without the participation of a judge. So that's why when somebody tells you they're on the HOA committee, you want to be really nice to them. By the way, okay. HOA, Charlie, just because homeowners of the association, homeowners That's association. Right. Thank you. Right, as opposed to a property owners association, which is a whole True. different kettle of fish. But we're sticking with HOA because that's what the legislation, what the legislation affected, and what it did was they've reined in um, the more zealous HOAs um, to provide protections. They passed several bills, and we'll just say 
right up front that not all HOAs are bad. We actually have a really good one. We're in a super neighborhood, and ours is awesome. They do a great job for us. And uh, but there are some out there that are that are bad, and they've protected from a bunch of overreach in what was passed here in the legislature. For instance, they can no longer prohibit a pool fence. Oh, that's good. There are some that that not let you put a fence around the pool, but they can specify what kind you can put in. So under SB uh, 1588, which was the one that uh, has all these in it now. And the exception to that is you can put in, without even talking to them, they can't regulate a black mesh fence. If it's high enough, if it's not, it's high enough not to climb over, it doesn't require approval. You can just go ahead and order and put that bad boy in. I like how specific that says, not too tall. Not too tall. It and depends I went, who you are. <laughs> right. And I, I will tell you, there, and you know, this is driving me nuts. This is crooked and I got to fix this because <laughs> okay, you know me. Fine. You know me. Okay, anyway. That's an outtake from Sorry, Mark Feld. Right. right. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what is Gutfield addressed yeah, his camera well, too? He does, he does the <clears> same. <throat> well, who's the guy who used to be on late night? He used to slap the side of the camera too. <laughs> I don't anyway, know. Anyway, so... But anyway, there's something else in 1588 you want to know about, and that is that under 1588, you can no, they can no longer put restrictions on security cameras or motion detectors on your property. There used to be a time when they could regulate that. And now, by the way, every Texan can put a perimeter fence up for security proper purposes around their property. Apparently, there were some HOAs that were restricting um, putting those up. Other changes that came up in 1588 uh, was uh, the right to canvas in subdivisions has been protected. There were subdivisions that were preventing people, political candidates, from canvassing inside of subdivisions. That's gone. You can no longer do that. You, they're, they're allowed to come in. They can't be prevented. And they the ability to file liens has been restricted. Oh, you know That's what? There, there is one more, by the way. Um, they also... Um, let me fix this so I can figure out where this thing is that I'm supposed to be on. Back to this one. Hang on. Sorry. Um, there we go. Religious displays cannot be banned anymore. So there were subdivisions that were giving people a hard time about putting up creches or or stuff for other holidays, and you can't do that anymore. And by the way, other changes is budget amendments can only be voted on in open meetings now. They can't do it behind closed doors. <clears throat> Any contract your HOA takes on that's over $50,000 requires bids. And if you pay your fees late, they can still report you to credit agencies, but your HOA has to pay for it. Because apparently before they passed this, if you were late and they and they reported you to the credit the credit listing services, they'd charge you the fee for doing mm-hmm. it. That's and that right. can't do they can't do that anymore, so that's the deal. That's what's news this week. So let's right. get to, and so we move on now to the the uh, other part of our program. Oh, and by the way, let me just open this up here. Da, 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 there we go. Okay, good. I had one window that wasn't open here. All right, I let's get. I don't do anything but sit here. <laughs> it's okay. You know, I don't years have any ago, buttons or anything to push. You know, that's years ago problems. when I first started working with Tom, my mother came to visit, and she says, "Well, Charlie, what does Tom do?" And I said, uh, he answers the phone. <laughs> pretty much on radio. Which pretty true. Back then. Pretty Still do. true. Still do. Yeah. All right, let's get to the questions. First question we have for you comes from Louise in Phoenix, Arizona. She says, I'm considering a 14 and a half SEER system versus a 15.75 SEER system. Both are single stage and the 15 has variable air handler. Is that extra sear really worth an extra $600? What say you, Tom? I say I wouldn't bother with it, especially in that part of the country where you don't have to worry a lot about uh, humidity control. You're just cooling the air and make yourself comfortable. Single stage is always the way I go, only because it's simple, it works, and uh, when it comes to repair costs, if you need a new motor or something like that, the costs are reasonable as far as parts go. So it's just a lot simpler, and I think simple is better, especially with the new SEER 14s, 15s, that kind of thing, uh, just the new equipment in general. If you compare that to a unit that might be 20 years old or 15 years old that you're replacing it, it's going to be so much more efficient. It's not worth another $600 on top because your savings is going to be diminishing so much 
that it would take you way too many years to get your money back. And so I would keep it simple. I think that 14 sear, you're gonna find great efficiency. It's gonna be simple, it'll be easy to repair. Uh, you won't have to have a genius technician to take care of it, someone who's specializing in that. That used to be a problem with air-to-air -air heat pumps and stuff. You had to have someone who was actually schooled in those kind of pieces of equipment, which you don't have to worry about with something like this. I think it's a good choice and save the $600 for something else because I don't see you getting it back for a long time. And of course, you're going to want to take care of it every year with a tune-up. and that's Do that with any kind of unit. Mine's right. 22 years old. I get my yearly tune-up too. If you don't do that, it's just like a car. A car can be brand new. A car could be 10 years, 20 years old. I've got one that's almost 60 years old, an old 66 Mustang. I still got to take care of it. You got to take care of it. It still runs fine. Not that I go out and use it every day. But the fact of the matter is that you got to maintain any kind of mechanical systems. And just to throw it out there right now, because this is timely, we have a hurricane, tropical storm, something coming our way into the Gulf of Mexico where Houston Maybe. is. It probably won't hit mm -hmm. us. Thank you. Right. Uh, but a generator is also a mechanical system that if you have one, maintain it every year also, because you never know. They said, it's way out there, right? You see the map? And they said, oh, but Florida will find it by Monday, just dumping all over them. Monday, that's only three days away because they move pretty right. quick. So always be prepared, even with your generators. It is one of the things that I found when I moved here that you have like about 72 hours warning, if not longer. If, if you know if, it's going to get close to hitting you, you bet. You, you bet. <clears throat> but people wait till the day before to go shopping. <laughs> I know. Well, yeah, let's not hoard toilet paper. It's not going to last that long. You know, a four pack should do you. Mm -hmm. uh, but just do I what worry you more. Need. Yeah, I worry more about a tropical storm than I worry about hurricanes. Oh, gosh, yes. People ask me, Tom, hurricanes. Hurricanes blast through in about 12 hours to 24 hours, and they're done. Tropical storm will sit on you. Harvey was one here in Houston we went through, I don't know, six years ago, five years ago. Uh, but it just dumped and dumped and dumped. And we had one called Francis and one called Allison way back when. I will take a hurricane over a tropical storm. In fact, Harvey, when it hit Corpus, hit as a hurricane, went back out in the Gulf, came back to Houston and stuck on us as a tropical storm. Yet we call it Hurricane Harvey because it made it that far. But it was a tropical storm on Houston, and we're the ones that got the worst of it. Yeah, I read about in the paper. Um, yeah, Ar you Armando. Uh, you got almost <laughs> flooded. Almost. Right up to his chinny chin chin right it there, missed man. It, it came right up just below yeah, our... our, our um, we we poles so, and meanwhile our back our backyard was bone dry. It was just the front, but whatever. It's okay. That's why Armando, he says his house is seventy one years old. Tom, he says I got an estimate for installation of cellulose blown in attic insulation. What are your thoughts on cellulose? I wouldn't use it. I would never use it. I've been telling people for years not to use it. There's a lot of different reasons why. Uh, chemicals such as borates that they use as fire retardants are put in there. Anytime you have a product that's sold as an insulation, it has to meet a fire standards for good reason because that stuff could flame up like crazy. People will put all kinds of junk up, well, ground up newspapers, which kind of cellulose is, but it's not, it's not refined. They'll put styrofoam balls, they'll put all this stuff in their attic thinking, hey, instead of throwing it away, I'll make insulation. But if you ever get a fire, the outgassing of that, what's going to happen to you, you'll kill you instantly. You got to be really careful. So insulation is controlled through a fire retardant materials. The beauty of fiberglass is it doesn't need any because it's a glass fiber. So it already meets the standards. When you get into refined cardboards and newspapers and paper products like cellulose, which is a natural product, they have to put these other things in there. And quite frankly, borates are, and they'll tell you, it kills roaches, it kills bugs, it's a poison. So you, you can't tell me it's not going to float around in your house and you're gonna have problems with it. And they have found, not just with insulation, but with fire retardant chemicals used in mattresses, clothing, carpets, all kinds of stuff, that they've done testing in people's homes for indoor air quality, which I'm a big proponent of nice, good quality air on the inside, fresh air return and things like that, that the, the rate of fire retardant chemicals in the air, especially on a newer home with newer products in there, is incredibly high. They don't know what it's going to do to the body. I don't either, but I don't want to find out because mm -hmm. in 1945, I always use this as an example, and I'll stop it here. In 1945, people would say, there is no scientific evidence that cigarettes cause cancer. And that was their answer to everything. So I'm not waiting for the scientific evidence. Common sense prevails in my life and on my show. Oh, you got to trust science, Tom. Yeah, I found that out this last year. 
Yeah. <laughs> Whatever science right. you want. As they say in England. <laughs> All right. All right. Next question. Say that. Yes. Patrick in Anchorage, Alaska says, for new construction, what's the best option for radiant barriers? Decking, paint, or foil against the roof decking? Or foil over the rafters? There, multiple you guests, can, Tom. Yeah, I know. You can do them all. Uh, my first thing, on, before we get to radiant barriers, you would never use it in Anchorage, Alaska. But who knows, maybe the guy's moving south. So I'm going to answer the question. It's always on new construction, the most easiest way, because there's no extra labor. There's a little more waste, but not that much, on your plywood decking. Just buy it with it already applied to the plywood decking. Shiny side down. they got to deck the, the roof anyway. And if they're good with the material, they'll, they'll make sure the waste, even with regular plywood, is kept to a minimum. And boom, it's down, it's done, no extra labor, nothing else, it's, else to do except move on with the construction of the home. So that's always for new construction, always the preferred way to do it. Now, why do you say in Anchorage you wouldn't use it, Tom? I mean, don't they have radiant heat coming in? I mean, the sure sun's the same distance from the earth there that it is here. Uh, I don't know if that's really true, but... Because the earth it is kind of wobbles Aren't around. We kind I don't of, know. Right. I'm not going to go well, down that let's science just say, road. In terms, of, in terms of how far the sun <laughs> yes. is from the earth, it's within miles of the same distance as That here. is true. But in Alaska, and it's a great question, your R value, because you're so concerned about the cold weather that, well, until last Mar uh, February here in Houston, we just don't get it. So we don't design for those kind of uh, problems. Uh, you're, you're, it's so cold in the winter, you have huge amounts of insulation in the attic into the 40s, maybe even into the 50s, depending where you are, what kind of frozen tundra you're in. And so in the summertime, you've so overdone it with the R value that the radiant barrier is gonna make no uh, uh, difference at all on your energy savings because you have such a high thermal barrier there. That's why mm -hmm. it's just a waste of time. Now, the other thing that can happen, which you don't wanna happen in those areas, is it can, it can retain heat that gets caught up in the gable attic area and you don't want that in the winter time you always want your temperature in the attic to be the same as the outside because what will happen is you'll get sweating you'll get snow melting on the roof you'll get ice dams forming you'll get icicles forming in the attics because the moisture is not leaving uh, you don't want hot air in an attic because hot air holds water and water will freeze so what you want it to do is stay very cool up there so it's really a bad place to use a radiant barrier in the winter and it makes no difference in the summer so why use it at all Fair enough. That was the science. <laughs> it could change tomorrow. Yeah, I, I hear you. You might need two radiant barriers. It makes perfect sense. <laughs> yeah, right, two. That's right. Use two of them. That's it. Just okay. for your own for your own safety, because that's you know. I'm you just joking. That's not a political thing. I'm just having fun. I don't like any politicians. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> not very Patrick. Neutral. Patrick writes yes. to us from, um, I think from Angleton. It doesn't say it here, but, oh yeah. It, okay. or, no, excuse me, Ralph, rather, from Angleton. Angleton I'm on top Texas. of it today. Know that well. I built a house down there for somebody. Yes. Feeling jet lag today for some reason. Say, so okay. he's building a new home in Houston, though, Tom, up in town. And he says, do you still recommend soaker hoses around the perimeter of a house to water the foundation? They're useful in some areas, and if you need them. Uh, do West Foundation Repair, a great certified home show ho Home Show Pro we have on our, our show here, they will put them in, but this is where you've got to know if you're really gonna put one in or if it comes back after the fact where you didn't have one, you had problems, and someone like Duwes says this is the best way to solve it immediately. Uh, if you're building a new home today, I would say probably in the Houston area at least, most people are gonna have sprinkler systems put in their yard. If you have a sprinkler system that covers the whole yard, there would be no reason to do it. In fact, they've done studies, people that have sprinkler systems and use them on a regular basis, just don't have them and turn them off and keep the azaleas and everything else around the foundation looking happy, your foundation is watered fine. If you're in a very dry area, you're not gonna do any landscaping, you're not gonna take care of the yard, uh, you're gonna let it dry out, you're on expansive clays, then yes, a watering system just around the foundation could be beneficial from the beginning if you have really bad clays. And the only way to do that if you're building a new home is look at the uh, soil report and you're going to have a PI, it's a plasticity index. And the higher the number, the more expansive the soils are. It'll tell you if it's in the 50s and 60s and you're not going to do any landscaping, you're not going to take care of your yard, you're not going to have a sprinkler system. 
then it could be beneficial to avoid someone like Due West coming out and having to do major work as well as a sprinkler system or now, a watering system, now I that's, say. that's about a slab. Now, I, I assume the same thing goes for a uh, uh, pier and beam or a block and base or a perimeter. I would say no. Uh, I, I, not in a, uh, no, not I'm saying in that a, the same thing you're saying, if the same thing goes for it as far as putting a watering system around something, you wouldn't yeah, if, do that. No, if there. I had a really well done, I built a lot of them, built one in Angleton we mentioned mm -hmm. earlier, okay. uh, a perimeter wall foundation is what I call them. And it's done right either with piers going down, holding up the wall, or you have a footer that's buried in the ground. You don't need to have the watering systems. And you have less foundation problems with a new one. Now you get into the old ones where they just threw concrete block on the ground, built a house. That's different. That's not what I'm talking about. But the reason is this. You have less contact with the soil to the foundation, with a slab. You're basically almost 100% of it doing all kinds of things. But when you have piers going in the ground with a wall on top, or you have a footer that's down on good soil, you have a very small area that's touching the soil. So the soil can move around it and it stays pretty clean. It's a slab that has the problem because there's so much contact. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that broad spread load that's on there, right? That's right. In fact, in the old days, today not so much, but in Houston, you used to have an engineer have to have an engineer report, engineered slab to put in the Houston uh, proper area, right? And but if you did a block and base or a perimeter wall, like I call them, and I did a lot of them, they wouldn't they would forego the engineer report because of that reason. Now, of course, mm. today you have to have it for everything. You talk about perimeter walls. I was uh, traveling with a business partner of mine. We were up in Ohio, and we were talking about how he's built his own house. Okay. I mean, he literally built his house. Oh, that's fine, yeah. And I told him, you know, there are people for that. <laughs> yeah, but no anyway. <laughs> Usually it takes but, a long time when you do it by yourself, but okay. Well, and, and <laughs> to that point, they have built like a 500-square-foot, one-room kind of studio thing for him, his wife, and now his seven-month-old child. And he built it with what you're talking about, the perimeter wall construction. They went down four feet and they built, poured this thing all the way around there, built a house on it because now he can just dig another one out and add on to it. And that's what he's doing. He's building the house gradually as he goes okay. along. So and I, and I guess that would be OK with that kind of foundation where you just keep adding on to it, I guess. Right. Yeah, you can do that even with slabs if you engineer it right. Yeah. But I will tell you this. It's easier to do what he's doing. It's, it's a good plan. It's done all the time. Because even if mm -hmm. you build them, sometimes you build them in sections, even though you're building the whole project. Uh, and, and it's funny you would say that. I remember when we used to, I used to run the Owner Builder Center at Houston Community College way back in the early 90s when it was a new thing to be your own contractor. And we would have people that would get land. In Texas, you buy a lot of land. Mm -hmm. And they would put up a garage apartment and say, oh, and then we're going to live in that and build the house. They got so comfortable in their garage apartment, they never built the house. They said, we didn't need the big house after all. And so it's funny that maybe we'll see how much much of a house he actually ends up with mm -hmm. once he gets comfortable. We got a couple more questions. I just want to add, though. Yes. Sandy and I bought some land up in that Texas Grand Ranch. Yeah. I bought three acres up there. And in the POA up there specifically says, you got to build a house first. And then that's yes, they did start to figure that stuff right. out. Right. They said, no, no, now we're on to you. And by the way, you can't just put a garage on the property because I was thinking, oh, I go to uh, you know, uh, and you're not allowed to camp on your property. I'm like, well, come on, man. Anyway, <laughs> so, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't mean to go all Joe Biden on you there, but all right. No, hey, I remember when all those rules changed back in the 90s when people started buying land in, in big subdivision, two acres, five acres, and they were doing that. Yeah, said, no, yeah. we can't do that. No, no, no. In fact, they even restrict the size of the building, the outbuilding. Yeah. So you can't put like a 500 square foot house and a 10,000 foot outbuilding <laughs> right. in back. So they got that. That's why we bought up there because they thunk that all, all that through. Uh, Paul says hi, by the way. He's in League City watching. Paul, hey, it's good Paul. to have you here. And Ernesto and uh, Florida, for Florida, Red, Flor, let's see. Let me try this. Floridelis. Yeah. And then, um, and also, Jesus is with us. He says, I recently noticed the floor in my stand-up shower has a weak spot. It dips when I step in that section. Well, don't do that. He says, what needs to be done to remedy this, Tom? You're going to have to remove the, I, I'm, I'm sure it's, um, hopefully it's a pan. Now, if it's a tile floor on a wood frame, like a second floor or a block and base a wood frame structure, you're going to have to tear the whole thing out and rebuild it because you've got water rot that's rotted the structure. If it's one of those fiberglass pans, which usually this question to me is, 
that pan's got to go. Those fiberglass pans, they put them down, they don't support them underneath. In other words, they don't put them in a mud set. So when they squish it down, you have this, this mud, we call it mud, but it's like a thin set or a sandcrete, and it fills all the voids and gives it a, a, a good hard surface so it doesn't fracture. And those things over time, especially as people get bigger, this is nothing personal to anybody, but as we go from 160 pounds to 260 pounds and 300 pounds, today's people are getting bigger. It, those things are fracturing under the weight. And as, as you slowly walk on it, it fractures more and more and more until all of a sudden it becomes like a little trampoline. So if it's a fiberglass pan, that all has to come out. And if it's a structure underneath there that's wood, it all has to come out and rebuild the whole thing, quite frankly. Trying to pull the pan out and replacing it without doing the walls and everything is very difficult. So usually it means a shower remodel. Well, you, I, I would never accuse you of having a failure of imagination, but it doesn't have to be a 300-pound person. It could be two 150-pound people. It could be five. You know, you know, you never know. You got the right <laughs> Today, shower. I judge no one. I we just ju make fun of everybody. <laughs> we judge no one. So, hey, Seuss, we hope that helped you out there, buddy. Jose, what yeah, there. Jesus, I think you're looking at a remodel. Yeah. And if nothing else, a new shower pan, and which might as well be a remodel. Yeah, because you got to cut the bottom. You can't match mm -hmm. the tile. Then you got to detail yeah. it all. So let's see what you can do. But somebody creative in there. Uh, but I think it's going to be just a new shower. It's time. Yeah, yeah hey, he stay just away said, from the pans. Uh, he put says, it, by put the way, tile if, floor in, it's good. He says it is a fiberglass pan. He just wrote in okay. and said, he, but he thanks you for the answer. Hey, you're welcome, you Jesus. Bet. We're glad to help. That's why we're here every Thursday at 4 o'clock Central Time, answering questions till we run out of them, and then we get out of here and go or do Or we get at 4.30, <laughs> whatever the case may be. <laughs> exactly. Whatever Whichever comes, comes first. first. Uh, <laughs> yes. Hey. I think it here it comes out there. All right, we've been together. how many years we've been doing this. All right, one know. more question here before we uh, hoist sail and um, and um, head out here, and that one comes to us from Michelle in Conroe, and she says the water in my bathroom takes forever to get warm or hot. It will get warm or hot if it runs five minutes. It's not a problem with any of the other faucets in the house. The one in my bathroom is a single faucet with separate hot cold water handles. So what is the cause? What can you recommend for her, Tom? If it gets hot and you have to run it and all of a sudden it's super hot, you have to cut it down with a cold and take your shower, it's just distance. It's from point A to point B. It has however, however they set up the plumbing run, you have a lot of water between uh, where the water heater is, I should do this, where the water heater is and where your point of use is, which would be your shower. So running it is the solution right now. There's nothing you can do short of just running it. And if it really is five minutes, I will tell you five minutes is a long time. So I hopefully it's less than that. It's, in most cases, people tell me that and it seems like five minutes, but if you really time it, see if that really help, that works. And you can open up some other faucets and maybe it'll mix some more hot water in the pipes and empty out the pipes, but that gets to be a chore. So the answer to this, if that's what the problem is, is a circulation pump. And you can have a plumber in Houston called Abacus Plumbing. They do a lot of these. It's a circulation pump that goes on the water heater, uh, or it can go into, in the bathroom, but usually they'll put it on the water heater. And it circulates very slowly when it needs to. It has a, a, a thermometer that tells it when it needs to do it and circulates the water in the pipe. You don't waste any water. It takes the cold water and dumps it in the cold until it gets hot, then it shuts down and all the pipes are full of hot water. And that way, when you turn it on, your water is warm to hot very quick. And so it's a great way to save water. Not much energy is saved, but a lot of water is saved if that becomes an issue. So look at a circulation pump if there's no other inherent problem in the house. I don't think there is. I think it's just homes today are getting bigger and bigger and they're spreading out. What used to be a, a big home at 1,800 square foot back in the 60s, today is a 4,500 square foot home, especially in Texas. And that's a normal home for a lot of people today. A lot of square footage, which means a lot of distance and a lot of pipe getting from one place to the other on the, in the walls. Now she's up there in Conroe, and that's I know Texas. that. Texas. Yeah. Well, no, I'm, <laughs> yeah. no. As you were asking to, if Abacus would go there, I mean they're right there at oh. Intercontinental. I'm sure that's a hop and a skip up the road for them. They're up in the woodlands in Conroe. Yeah, I'll tell you yeah. what's amazing. If you haven't been up there, is if you take 59, uh, 45 North there, right? Through, through the woodlands, just keep going. How far out it stays six, eight lanes wide, all the way up to Huntsville now. 
they were building that. You were moved up to Willis, where the Bentwater subdivision is. I built a home right. up in there for some people. And I remember all that construction. That construction's been going on. I've been out of the building business for 10 years almost now. And that construction has been going on for those 10 years because I drove it every day. And Charlie, not too long ago, I had to drive to Dallas because of my dad. And uh, I noticed the same thing. It does go on and on, and it's going to go on and on all the way to Huntsville eventually. Well, it does. It makes it all the way to Huntsville now. Does it make it like that yeah. all the way to Huntsville? Okay. Yeah. That's because where you're living now will soon be an extension of downtown, you know, where you bought your property up there in Willis. Yeah, yeah I know. That's what I told Sandy. I said, we bought this country, this this property up in the country, but here's a good deal. My the, my back property line has these signs on it that says National Forest. I'm not that worried That's about good. it. So, yeah, all right. But remember that happened in Magnolia. That used to be out in the country. It talked yeah. to the people who moved to Magnolia. I, yeah. I'll see you and That's raise you. Downtown Houston. <laughs> River, West U used to be out yes. in the country. I you know? know? So, so I, did anyway. Champions where I live. That used to be the country homes. They would drive and spend the summer up there. <laughs> all right. Well, we time to land the airplane. Tell them, tell them where bet. they can get where they can find more of you. All right, homeshowradio.com. You get lots of videos. Our certified home show pros, if you listen, uh, if you listen or are watching us from the Houston area, of course. And then on Sports Radio 610, you have, there you go, all the people that really good. We check them out. Uh, these are the best of the best in the Houston area. And Houston's a big city, so there's a lot of competition, but we find the best ones to re recommend to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. On Sports Radio 610, of course, on the radio, 9 to noon on Saturday, 8 to 11 on Sunday on Sports Radio 610. And bingo, we, can't, we ever, can never forget about Danny Milliken. He's one of my favorite people because he builds the audience on Saturday morning for me, and he does a great job because gardening is a hot topic right now in the Houston area because of the cold topic we had in February. So he builds a great audience for me, and he does a great job on Saturdays from 7 to 9. Yeah, not like our lead-in on Sundays. All right. <laughs> well, I won't go there. I'll let, the, I'll let Mosier Media take care of that. Yeah, I'm Ram on it. All right. <laughs> yeah, okay. you, tune in sometime around, I don't know, 10 <laughs> till 8. See if you can handle <laughs> yeah, it. All right. Yeah, all right. Let me give you a hint. The show's called Eye on Houston, and it's on the radio. Okay? They, so they started with a problem right there. Never all thought right. about that. Yes. Hey, something new before we go. Uh-oh. I just want to tell you that uh, if you really like those home flipping shows, there is a new one from the Do We Really Need This department. And that is a show called Murder House Flip. Really? Yeah. No, this okay. is a re this is a really a thing, okay? And I it's you. it's used to stream on Roku, but now they the the show is f streaming on uh, it used to be on something called Quibi. Right. And what this show is, is it used to be, uh, hang on a second, I've got some pictures here for you. Um, they used to have, um, you're going to love this. They go to houses where there have been horrible murders and then they, f they remodel and flip the house. Like for instance, in the first episode, they're going to go to one where there were seven murders and they redo the house and help mur how my market. So if you like to mix CSI with your your HOA, we've got the show for you. It's called Murder House Flip, and you can find it on Roku. So I know Tom. And they, we can also throw in there the Ghost and Mr. Muir or whatever. Yeah, that, Mrs. Muir. You're right. You're right. <laughs> 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 okay. Anyway, right. Charlie, you got way too much time, and we need to. Get I do. Some I'm more afraid so. We're out. We we'll be back money. again next Thursday <laughs> at four o'clock Central Time. Got a question? Ask Tom. Home show, radio. Home show, radio. Home show, radio. Free advice from a pro who knows. Home show, radio. Home show, radio.